when you look at the world around you, it was built by people. And that if they can do it, you can do it. You may not be as fast as they are, but you can do anything you see around you. And, and, and that was a good philosophy, and it was something that stuck with me, and it has served me instead, because you, know, you have to do a little research every once in a while, but you can do anything you set your mind to. Um, with painting and, and pottery and everything else, stained glass, could make a living with it up here. You can't give it away up here, for the most part. Uh, at least I couldn't. The natural woodworking that I do is an expression of my world because I use the natural forms that I see in my furnishings. And if I was in a rough camp, I, that I would be doing the same thing in a rough camp, although I probably wouldn't be making the stuff to last for, for 100 years or so. I'd be making it for a one season deal. Uh, so the, that, that in and of itself is, is, in a nutshell, I guess, is what, what it's all about. And then now I get people that stop here and look at the backyard and they say, boy, you don't know what you got. Yeah, I do know what I got. I live here, I work here, I pay the price for working here. And you come up here for two weeks a year, I know what I got. I got life. Yeah, life is good. Yesterday, year round for my shoes. December 7th, 1941. Don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. Do I, do I, do I, do I, do I, do I? Have you heard about Pumpy? Ben Brunt's Pumpy? He gone off, you know? Where? His kinsmen work in the boatyard up along the sound near Whitestone. Maybe he can find work there? Won't they find him? He can't speak English too good. And his hair all knotted up will look out of place there. Well, out there they won't notice. Lots of comings and goings. And they speak mostly Dutch. Maybe they need a good woodworking man. Can't be bothered with such foolishness. My man wasn't able to come and see us for the last two Sundays. Oh, no, why not? We have a tendency to pay attention to birds. We call them an indicator species because, like human beings, birds are at the top of their food chain, if you will, of the web of food. And the harbor can support these birds 
because of the benthic, that is, the animals who live in the mud. Sewage was choking our waterways before clean water laws were passed. Aquatic animals need oxygen that is dissolved in water in order to survive. Sewage lowers the dissolved oxygen content of water. If it becomes too low, the water cannot support any animals. Do you see this image as a sign of hope for the future or as an accident waiting to happen? I think that the resiliency of nature is, is very inspiring and, and gives us a lot to work with to try and bring about even greater recovery in this harbor. It's not just here for commerce and industry. It's here for wildlife and it's for, for human recreation. It's for people to enjoy. There are things that we don't know too much about yet, but we know that, that they are there and potentially hazardous to the birds, like heavy metals, PCBs, dioxin, and a host of, of very toxic chemicals that are in, in these salt marshes right here. What we were able to do is to look at a variety of species of birds and compare their biology, their breeding biology especially, before the spill and after the spill. <laughs> Uh, Galveston Island is a place uh, where um, people have to stop on their way to other Texas ports uh, or into the interior of Galveston Bay to go up uh, Buffalo Bayou. So already by the uh, 1820s and 1830s, uh, Galveston is becoming a natural stopping place uh, for immigrants to Texas. Galveston, for Texas a big city, looked to newly arriving Europeans like a setup of paper toys. The houses stood on posts, ready to be moved from one place to another. Emma Altgeld, 1854.
good sense that there was something wrong, that uh, something might happen here. We, we were ripe for that. We understood that. But yeah, we were totally unprepared. And we saw it happening in the other places where people were dying and places were burning for days upon days and, uh, and subsequent to that, you know, he said, well, we're, we're prime for that here too. But we didn't take any precautions. We didn't start doing any police community relations. We, start, we just went on about our business that we always did. Uh, and when it happened, we were totally unprepared. Yeah. I remember being outside playing because it was the summer. And I remember a, um, a helicopter. So how, how old were you? I had to be about six, seven. And there was this big empty field that was in the middle that we played in. And I remember a helicopter coming down pretty, pretty loud and just like scary. Um, like, what's going on? You know, and uh, where did it come from and what is it here for? You know, it's almost like seeing something from another planet. And I remember when the riot started because we had a television and it came over the news and it was at Springfield Avenue and all of a sudden we heard this shooting and my mother ran into the front room and she looked out the window and I was in my side, I was, I, my room was on the side and we heard this gunshots and gunshots and she said get down on the floor. Get down on the floor, everybody. It's me and my two brothers and my dad. And then helicopters overhead. And it was like a movie, as far as I was concerned. You know, you just couldn't believe it. Nineteen sixty eight is a tumultuous year. The war in Vietnam is tearing the country apart. Amid this upheaval, Johnson decides not to seek re election. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Then, in just a few months, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were both assassinated and the Democrats nominated Hubert Humphrey for president, while protests and rioting spread throughout the city of Chicago. In the end, Richard Nixon successfully appeals to what he calls America's silent majority and wins the election. 